welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Zoe Chanel. I'm the curator for the Russia Series Center. This talk is part of a series of conversation between artists, scientists, and healthcare providers as part of the group exhibition Chronicles of the Chronic, uh, which is a show that celebrates the creativity and re resilience of the chronically ill community, and it features regional, national, and international artists whose artistic practice reflect holistically upon the experience of living with chronic health condition. The show is on view until March 31st and open Wednesday through Sunday, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Today, we're in conversation with Dilani Linsky and Mailing Kopecki. So Dilani is a regenerative science PhD student at Mayo Clinic Graduate School of Biomedical Science. And Mailing Kopecki is an artist and also the Learning Center Coordinator at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Both Kopechi and Liski were diagnosed with pediatric onset multiple sclerosis at a young age. Through their distinctive practice, they both advocate for the visibility and empowerment of the patient and the MS community. Dilani was diagnosed at 11 years old. Pediatric onset MS is a rare form of a disease that is more commonly diagnosed. Today, she's a graduate student of the inaugural class of the Regenerative Science PhD track at Mayo Clinic, Gradu Graduate School of Biomedical Science. And she was previously based in Rochester and more currently based in Florida. Mei Ling is an artist based, Kopechi is an artist based in Plymouth, Minnesota. She specializes in high detail, hyper realistic drawings and paintings, and her work visualizes how she navigates the world with MS. The work focuses on re her relationship with healthcare, the physical evidence of her symptoms in MRI scans and the perception of the world when struggling with MS symptoms. Using art as a mean of communication, uh, Mei Ling spreads MS awareness and advocates for people with invisible illnesses. And her work is featured in Chronicle of the Chronic. We want to start with maybe Mei Ling. Want to go first? As Zoe mentioned, I'm the Learning Center Coordinator at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design in the Learning Center and Accessibility Services Department, where I work directly with students who have disabilities and chronic illnesses. I'm also an artist in Chronicles of the Chronic, and I'll be talking a bit about my work leading up to now and also the work that I have in the exhibition. When I was 13 years old, I noticed a strange buzzing sensation in my neck and my spine when I would bend my head forward. My parents took me to my pediatrician, who was unable to determine what the cause of this sensation was. After a couple of weeks, the buzzing went away, and I kind of left it at that for a while. I would later learn that this sensation is called Lermite's sign, and it is one symptom of multiple sclerosis. So on this slide, I have a detail of a drawing that I will talk a bit more about later. It shows kind of what I imagine Lermite's sign to feel like, if you could see it visually. It wasn't until a couple of years later, when I was 15, that I was finally diagnosed with MS. At the time, I was experiencing involuntary convulsions in my torso. This time, my pediatrician recommended that I get an MRI scan, and sure enough, I had active lesions in my brain, as well as other lesions from a prior flare-up. On this slide, there is a painting I did of the little teddy bear I got when I was diagnosed, because I was a pediatric patient. This teddy bear was from the Mayo Clinic. I also included a brief description of multiple sclerosis for those of you who are not familiar. So I'll just read that very quickly. MS is an autoimmune disorder that affects the central nervous system. The immune system damages the myelin sheath, which is the protective coating on nerve cells. This affects the nerve's ability to transfer signals. Also, only about 3-5% to 5 of all individuals with MS will experience disease onset before the age of 16. So Delaney and I are very lucky. We're part of that group. <laughs> so special. One of the problems with being diagnosed young is a lot of people tend to, they tend to respond with a lot of skepticism when I was talking about having MS. It was almost 15 years ago at this point, but I still remember how it felt when people would tell me, oh, you're too young to have MS, or, you know, you look fine, you look healthy, maybe your symptoms aren't as bad as you're saying, or you were fine last week, so, you know, what's wrong with you? I ended up going to school primarily online starting in my sophomore year of high school, and this continued throughout undergrad. I had a 504 plan in high school and then disability accommodations in undergrad and grad school. And throughout those years, I really had to learn how to advocate for myself and communicate my needs. There were many years where I found myself wanting to keep my MS a secret from my peers. This, combined with a lot of imposter syndrome, often led to me pushing myself too hard and then my symptoms getting worse because of it. On this slide, I have a picture of myself in a hospital bed at the Mayo Clinic back in 2013. 
It wasn't until shortly after I graduated with my Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Minnesota that I started to create artwork about my experiences. At first, I focused more on how MS dictates some quote unquote everyday scenes and what environments have grown to feel familiar. This is a painting I did. It's a restaurant that's no longer there at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, but it was there for a long time. As those of us with chronic illnesses know, the doctor's office can become a very familiar place after many years of appointments. So I began to paint what I saw during visits to both the Mayo Clinic and my local clinic in Plymouth, Minnesota. I was interested in how these spaces that I once had a lot of anxiety in have grown to feel comfortable. I look at my own photos that I take while I'm in these spaces and then kind of mentally alter them as I paint to reflect how I felt in this space. So I titled this painting Familiarity and Comfort. This is a um, uh, doctor's room in the uh, neurology department at the Mayo Clinic. This is the waiting room where I'm waiting to get my MRI scans at the Mayo Clinic. Here is the lab at my local clinic where I get my blood work done. Here is a painting that is, I titled this Welcome Back. This is actually I can go back up really quick. This is the same uh, hospital room that I'm in here, but I titled it Welcome Back because I was there for so many days in a row. And then this is actually a painting of the IV machine that's in that room. And these paintings are all eight and a half by 10, so they're pretty small. I also began to think a lot about the sort of proof that people wanted to see when I would talk about my symptoms. So while you can't see the damage in my brain when looking at me, you can see it in my MRI scans. Once again, I was trying to figure out ways to show people visually what I was experiencing. So this slide contains an image of me creating paintings based off of my MRI scans. While the digital images of the scans are only about 400 pixels wide, I paint them at roughly the same size as my head to provide a better sense of context. This is a series of nine MRI scans from 2010. These are gouache and ink on black paper. These are some scans, or paintings of scans that I had done in 2020 watercolor and gouache. And then this is a painting that has two scans from 2010 on the left and two from 2020 on the right. So you can see more clearly the progression of the disease. This was inspired by an Instagram trend called the 10 year challenge where you would have a picture of yourself 10 years ago and then your a current picture to see, you know, how you've grown, how you've changed. So I found that through the process of painting and studying my own MRI scans in great detail, I was also addressing my own discomfort and imposter syndrome. I found that these scans really validated how I felt and also the symptoms that I have been experiencing. As I considered the lesions and the damage in my brain while painting, I began to turn back to wanting to visualize the experience of MS more. So during my time in the Masters of Fine Arts program at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, my mentor, Michael Banning, suggested that I turn more to drawing. I was having some pretty bad symptoms at the time. It was hard for me to keep up with those super realistic paintings. So I started to create these sketches that reflected various MS symptoms. In a way, these acted as a journal for me, documenting what days I was dealing with symptoms like fatigue, brain fog, heat intolerance, and more. The sketches that I did in the spring semester of 2021 I did all of these while I was experiencing symptoms, so some are more well-rendered than others. And then I started to create a bit more well-rendered drawings of these symptoms. These are muscle weakness, brain fog, and fatigue. Graphite on Duralar. And here are some more of those. I started kind of layering these different instances because I've noticed that when I have brain fog, time also tends to blur, and I can look back at my day like, wait, what just happened? I This day went by and I don't remember anything. And then this is one of my recent drawings when I had fatigue and I feel like my muscles start to get really weak. So my hands are kind of transparent as I try to lift this glass and it's near my laptop. So it's kind of precarious. I also created some paintings of my MS symptoms. This one is heat intolerance. I'm outside in the heat. I can't handle it. My vision starts to blur. I start to get a little weak. So this was outside of my office when I just wanted to take a break and go look at some daisies on the Minneapolis College of Art and Design campus. And I was just out there for a few minutes and I was trying to take a picture and I was like, oh my gosh, I, I, I suddenly can't see. And then it was so frustrating because I just wanted to look at the flowers. I decided, oh, you know what? I might as well make a painting. About this. And then this is a double vision, kind of what double vision really looked like when I had that symptom. By sharing my point of view drawings and paintings, I was actually able to find a lot more community. I've received comments on Instagram and messages from people saying like, oh my gosh, like this is what that looks like, or this is what that feels like. And people saying that it's kind of validating to know that uh, there are other people who do understand what they're going through. During my time in the MFA program, I also got involved with a student group at the University of Alberta called the MS Student Society. 
This group is made up of not just students with MS, but also students who are studying MS or students with loved ones who have MS. And it was a really great opportunity to share our stories. And as we were sharing, I started to notice that a lot of us had similar experiences, especially being students with MS. This was super validating for me because I felt like, oh my gosh, you know, we've had this similar sort of struggles in school with not being believed or being really frustrated because we weren't able to write or type or what or see or whatnot. Um, so for my master's thesis, I interviewed some of these members and created drawings that portray their symptoms. These drawings are currently at the Rochester Art Center in Chronicles of the Chronic. And alongside the drawings, I also have these stories and um, both written and uh, verbal stories that you can listen to or read from these students. I kind of just asked them, you know, what is a time in school when you had an MS symptom and how did that affect what was going on? So I created these symptom drawings. And then also this is another piece of mine from my master's thesis that is in Chronicles of the Chronic. For this drawing, I was thinking more about what would the symptoms look like if you actually could see them. So I created this kind of life-size outline of myself on graph paper and then layered various drawings portraying different MS symptoms based on where I feel them in my body. As you saw earlier, this is Lermite's sign here, this sort of electric sensation, facial paralysis. At one point, the right side of my face just stopped working. And so I drew that as if I were made of stone, double vision as if my eye were like kind of two eyes layered on each other, brain fog, migraines, fatigue. This is also available on my website if you'd like to take a look or in the exhibition if you're interested. Um, and then here also a couple of photographs from the installation. So you can see the life-size drawing, as well as the student stories with iPads to read and listen to their stories. One theme that has persisted throughout all of my work is the idea of using art as a form of advocacy and spreading awareness. As I mentioned, I work in the Learning Center at MCAD, and it can be really hard to see students go through a lot of the things that I went through, especially when it comes to professors not believing them or their peers not understanding or friends not taking their illnesses seriously. But I hope that by sharing my experiences, I can help spread awareness about this, and hopefully people will become more understanding. This past year, I was also able to give workshops at the Mayo Clinic and the University of Minnesota Rochester that encouraged participants to try drawing different symptoms or sensations. This is not only a good exercise for becoming more aware of your own body, but also it shares some of the frustrations people can have when trying to describe their symptoms with words. Kind of moving more into my current work, this is a current project that's a little related to spoon theory, which I can go into a bit more if we have time. Participants are given a limited number of stickers to place on tasks that they want to complete. However, the number of tasks that they have is far greater than the number of stickers that they have. Through this project, I want to share the experience of a bad spoons day or a bad symptom day when you're chronically ill and how you need to prioritize and sacrifice some tasks in order to do others because you have such a limited amount of energy. So this example, um, there are three tasks. Um, so far, I have 10 participants and so these are stickers from 10 participants. You can see most people want to get dressed, most people want to brush teeth, and some people, they had to sacrifice one of those in order to send emails. And also on these digital drawings that I printed out, I have quotes that say things like, oh, like, don't be gross, you needed to respond to this email yesterday, like, people will think you're lazy if you don't get dressed, and kind of these things that we can sometimes hear in our heads when we're chronically ill and kind of feeling guilty about not having the energy to do all of these tasks that a lot of people think are super simple and easy, but when you're so low on energy, they require a lot of thought and energy. And this is related to that project. This is a to-do list series of drawings that I'm creating based off of my own daily to-do list. Once again, sharing how these super simple tasks still require like conscious thought and action on my part. So I kind of, once again, was layering these tasks to show kind of the not very linear flow of time on these days where I'm just having really bad brain fog. As I mentioned, these projects are still works in progress, but I'm super excited about where they're going. I've included contact info here that um, I can also put in the chat later, but yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you, Mayling. I'd love to see your more square and work. Do you know if you're ready to like talk about your work though? That would be a good time. Good morning. It's it's absolutely an honor to be here. And I thank you so much for inviting me. And, and Mailing, you have quite an incredible story. I felt so heard throughout that. So it's it's really an honor to be here. My name is Delaney, and I'm a regenerative sciences PhD student at the Mayo Clinic. And I actually transferred to the Florida campus, um, as Zoe said a little bit ago, 
um, to focus my project on regeneration in multiple sclerosis. Regenerative medicine in general is a relatively new field of scientific research where we are essentially shifting that traditional research approach of preventing disease, and instead we're focusing on promoting repair of damaged tissue. But right now, as a field, we do not currently offer regenerative medicine as a primary mode of treatment for patients. So everything in this context is entirely research-driven at this standpoint. On average, it takes about 12 years to get a potential treatment from laboratory research to become available in your medicine cabinet. And in a field like regenerative medicine, this could potentially take a lot longer because we're essentially starting from a completely different perspective. And this is why it is so instrumental to start with the right research questions. And that's the aspect of, of what my talk is gonna cover. So I gravitated towards this particular field because I wanted to focus my research on multiple sclerosis, but again, specifically in the context of myelin regeneration. MS is actually unique in the fact that partial myelin regeneration can actually occur, but the contributing factors to this are not well understood. And as a result, therapeutically targeting myelin repair has been a challenge in the field. And that's what I'm hoping to research during my time as a PhD student. But more specifically, I have interest in restoring vision in patients who have lost it as a result of the disease. This is because I was diagnosed with MS when I was 11 years old. So of course, this is a particularly rare form of, of this unfortunately very common disease. In fact, we say that there are less than 10,000 children in the world living with MS. It's estimated that about 1,000 of those are diagnosed before the age of 12. As a result, I was rendered visually impaired within five years of my diagnosis. I permanently lost the eyesight in my left eye by the time I was 16. And so during my hospital stay, at the time of my diagnosis, the physicians would enter my hospital room and discuss with my parents what I had felt had gone well above my, my fifth grade vocabulary level. But the next thing I know, I would be wheeled away to have invasive diagnostic procedures done to me. And so the turning point for me was that one day um, I had overheard that I needed a lumbar puncture um, from a group of doctors. And I didn't necessarily know what that meant, but I knew that the word puncture <laughs> didn't sound like something I wanted to undergo. And in my efforts to essentially plead my way out of this situation, all I could really do as an 11 year old was just cry. So on my way to this procedure, I swore to myself, never again will I be in this situation where I don't know what's going on and I, mean, I don't even understand the words. My parents had left me with an iPad. This is back in 2008, um, just to pass time in the hospital and just play games on. But instead, I extensively researched what I had overheard in my hospital room that day. I was also asking questions to just about anybody that would enter my hospital room. So whether that was nurses, kitchen staff, physicians, just about anybody, I always had a question and I realized that everybody had something to teach me. Months later now, uh, when the physicians informed my parents and I of the ultimate diagnosis of pediatric MS, I was fully ready to have this discussion with them. And they told me that, you know, there wasn't much known about MS at the time, um, especially not in children, but based off of the prognosis of this sort of condition, that I would likely be using a wheelchair by the time I graduated high school. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, this took so much time and effort and brain power and everything to diagnose me. And this was the answer. Where was the second half of this story where we have these amazing medical breakthroughs and innovative research to prevent that from happening. And to me, I mean, maybe we can just argue the fact that I was, you know, 11 years old, but it didn't necessarily feel like a dead end of the road for me. If anything, I was just given the keys for an endless possibility of what we could do with this condition. And so when I got to college, um, I joined a lab that studied MS and there I was taught a lot of the laboratory skills and tools that we have available in our scientific toolbox to be able to investigate disease. But personally, I was able to route my prior questions that I had about myself in a more applicable way now that I was learning the skills. Once I graduated college, um, I was awarded a research fellowship at the Mayo Clinic, which there, as I'm sure you can imagine, I joined a lab that studies MS. And today, I'm a graduate student studying MS. But my favorite part of this story is that 
I actually work with the researchers that I used to read about when I was a little kid. So just an incredible full circle opportunity for me. The last thing I'll mention about this story is that I didn't talk about the fact that I had MS up until very recently and up until I was 24. But I began to realize along the way that having this disease was not a weakness, but actually a massive strength because I had this personal insight into a condition that others don't have. This condition we are actively researching with millions of lives, depending on what we do. But of course, it's not just me with this insight. Patients themselves are essentially like a walking database. They have exclusive insight as to how a disease affects the body at the individual level, even within the same disease subgroups themselves. And in medical research, all of our pursuits start with a very fundamental question. And this is the first overarching step of everything. And then from there, we design experiments to answer that question. But despite these, these great advancements that we've made thus far in understanding of disease within research, we definitely have a ways to go as there's millions of people still suffering. So it's kind of like how I mentioned at the beginning of this talk when the physicians told me I'd be using a wheelchair by the time I was 18. I mean, we definitely have a lot to do. And so much of the research that is being pursued today is actually being driven by people who do not have a direct connection to the conditions being studied. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. However, we may be missing the perspective of those that we're striving to help with biomedical research. In other words, having potential oversight of that fundamental question that those without the disease may not think to ask. My humble suggestion to this field, if I may, is that patients coupled with the acquired laboratory skills can develop these instrumental questions that are crucial to advancing biomedical research that those without the disease may not think to ask. So with everything, um, I'm proposing this initiative for the recruitment and training of patients into the scientific workforce to study their own diseases. And that's because as it stands right now, at least that I'm aware of, there are not that many of us that are patient scientists in the field. We do not have a metric as to what diseases are being covered. This is the breadth and the diversity of this particular community of patients. We just, we just don't have a metric like that, or if it even exists. I launched the International Society of Patient Research Scientists, or INSPIRES for short, initially as an opportunity for patient scientists to network and collaborate, but also so that we can track the prevalence and the needs of and the contributions made by patients in the scientific workforce. This aspect is relatively early in its beginnings, but it's, it's well on its way. And with this, the optimistic goals of INSPIRE's leadership are to collaborate with the federal stakeholders to develop a research training program that's awarded to patients who are interested in the ongoing laboratory pursuits at relevant institutions. And so this ideal training curriculum emphasizes the early stages of the scientific thought process and experimental design. And it will also have a dedicated mentored research training in the basic and translational biomedical research. And it will also provide professional development opportunities. So what I mean by this are active discussions and laboratory meetings, graduate level coursework, and um, attending research seminars and scientific conferences. And this is more along the lines of what we're actively working on right now to kind of establish this idea from more of a conceptual standpoint. You know, what would this look like if this were to exist? Taken together in a field where patient representation is, is highly underrepresented with the, this proposed initiative, um, we optimistically anticipate in years to come that each lab will be equipped with a patient research scientist in addition to the other instrumental laboratory personnel. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think uh, you're 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 like building dream of a future uh, that like I hope it ha like it's very near, right? <laughs> I'm gonna start with one question uh, just to give people a little bit of time to uh, think about something to ask. So one thing that like struck me and kind of inspired me to like get the two of you in the same room, <laughs> Zoom room, right? Uh, well, first of all, it's like you're like really positive um, approach to being a patient, being ill and doing something for the community, right? And it seems that even if you work in very different fields, there is something that kind of ties your work together. And I see that to be the communication. So that could be words, uh, thinking about a TED talk or data collection, 
uh, or art and uh, advocacy. So I wonder how did you develop this language, uh, a visual language, a, a written language, spoken language for talking about the very aspects of your illness in your daily life and in your work? And maybe Dilani, you want to start? Sure. Yeah, great question. I would say from a scientific standpoint, we say that in order to communicate your science, your research to what we would call a lay audience, I don't think that's the right word, but essentially someone that's outside of your field, it would have to be at an eighth grade vocabulary level or less. Quite frankly, I've always felt like that was just a little too high. For me, what I tend to do when I have to give outside research projects and stuff like that, um, I think back to myself when I was 11 years old and how I would have liked a particularly complex scientific topic to have been explained to me. Anybody can give a, a one hour research presentation on, on the data, lose half of your audience and nobody will say anything. I think it really is one of the most incredible skills if you're able to explain your science to someone that's like outside of your field. And if you think about it from my standpoint, you know, within science, we have immunologists and microbiologists and neuroscientists and I mean just about everything but we all speak a slightly different language and so it's just it's so important to me to bring in these different viewpoints um, even not only just from a scientific standpoint but just in general I guess I'm just repeating myself here but I, I just really think it's an important skill to be able to communicate your research to um, people outside of of your field. Yeah no I completely agree especially when thinking about how you wished that things would have been explained to you at a young age. I feel like we're, we have very similar approaches to this, but we, you know, even as always said, we're in di very different fields because that is one of the reasons that I really wanted to start sharing my experiences through art because art is a visual language and it is something that, you know, you don't need a medical degree to understand like, hey, this painting is what it looks like when someone has double vision. I found that and I mean, I, I don't, maybe this doesn't sound too great, but I love when people get frustrated when looking at my drawings, especially uh, one of them where I'm talking about fatigue and, you know, there's like words and stuff, but you can't actually read them. And people are like, oh my God, I just, I wish I could read them. Like, this is so frustrating. I can't access this. And like, that's exactly how it feels. And just being able to share that experience in a way that anybody can understand, I think is super important, especially when you're talking about, you know, these smaller fields, I mean, MS, you know, not most people don't have MS. And um, so it's really important to think about these sort of even different sort of visual descriptions of different symptoms. Going back to the workshop I gave recently at the University of Minnesota Rochester and the Mayo Clinic, I think that, you know, learning to describe symptoms in a way for, let's use pain as an example. So describe your pain on a level from one to 10. The doctor says that to a patient and patient, you know, many times will get frustrated because like, well, I don't know. I don't have any like baseline for this. I'm not sure exactly how to approach this. And so what I try to do, even with my students that I work with, is like, okay, so you're fatigued today. What type of fatigue is it like, is it a sharp fatigue? Do you feel blobby today? Do you feel round? Do you feel like angular and um, I find that this sort of language can really help kind of simplify everything to something that's easier for everybody to understand. Speak the language of those you want to listen. Yeah I like I like how you you talk about accessibility in a way right and I guess my next question is sort of connected to that so there is a journey that um, takes patients currently ill people to through visibility like it's to me it's the journey to visibility right and I wonder uh in your experience some of the healing uh happens through the medical research right and the development of that right new medication new approaches all of that right but um there's also like a more emotional spiritual everyday life uh kind of healing right that can happen through other forms of medicine I would call it in that sense, uh, is visibility, so being open about your your illness, your symptoms with your community, uh, did that bring any healing or similar? How was it for you? I would say one of the most empowering aspects of, of having this diagnosis in general was just learning about it. You know, um, there was not much known at the time um, in 2008 when, when my diagnosis was made, but, um, you know, of course, especially not in children, 
And so I did the best that I could, you know, at the time and in Wellington now to strengthen my understanding and knowledge of, of this condition. And at the very least, you know, especially when I was a little kid, it, it gave me the opportunity to, you know, not only be prepared for what could potentially come for me, but also gave me the opportunity to have these active discussions with the people who were um, essentially treating me. And I really think it built me to be who I am today because, you know, at the end of the day, I was essentially going into this with, you know, already losing the battle, meaning like I was that kid in the chair um, with the physician in front of me with decades of experience, you know, with, with my blind left eye and, and, you know, an unusual childhood condition. So, yeah, I mean, I definitely think there's healing and in, invisibility and um, especially because knowing that what you're doing can have such a large impact on on this pretty large community. I personally didn't talk about MS until I was 24, um, which I know is kind of late in the game, especially like for me being in this field for so long. But I was always worried, um, like Mailing was saying, that people would treat me differently or, or see me as lazy and stuff like that um, when I was experiencing symptoms. And so I decided eventually to just like bite the bullet because I think that this is a big part of of who I am and why I do the work that I do and why I'm excited about this field and and all of these things. And so I, I kind of did it in an unconventional way. And I applied for TEDx and got it. And that was actually my my first time saying something like that to the world. And it just really took a big weight off my shoulders. And it it made me realize that this is not something to be ashamed of. This is something to be, I, mean, I don't want to say proud of, but like, you know, it's it was just a, a perspective shift for me. And when I started creating MS art, I was also 24. <laughs> So maybe that's just a special age when we decide, you know what, we're going to share our stories about this. I agree. Like there is a lot of kind of empowerment that comes from researching your own disease. And I that's how I felt when I was painting my MRI scans, just being like, I really encourage patients to look at their own MRI scans and ask questions because when you're in that room, you're looking at your doctor is like, here's where the damage is. You know, you're sitting there kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, there's a lot going on. You were just told that, you know, there are areas and damage of your brain making different symptoms happen. As you mentioned, Delaney, also that feeling of like being afraid that other people won't believe you when you talk about these things, you know, and kind of really the journey of researching your disease and knowing your own body and understanding what's going on can help with that sort of confidence and that sort of feeling like, okay, this is real. Even if my professor says, I'll share a brief story. I had a professor in undergrad where at the time I was having some, uh, I had a flare up and I got a lot of muscle weakness in my um, hands and legs. And I mentioned to them like, hey, I can't participate in this week's in-class activity because I have a flare up. And the professor said, well, you were fine last week. And I was at that point I had to, I ended up withdrawing from that class because I was just like, okay, I don't think that this is a good fit for me, but I felt so bad after that. And it made me feel like I can talk about my condition even less because like people just don't understand. So also just visibility when it comes to sharing what it's like being chronically ill, especially at such a young age, I think can be really helpful, Delaney, as you mentioned, because people will also be helped by hearing your stories. You know, I work with students every day who have disabilities and chronic illnesses, and sometimes they're not as keen to share what it's like. And then, you know, if a student, for example, let's just say a student has chronic migraines, and they say, oh, well, I mean, I had a migraine, and, you know, I mean, it was a lot of pain. I'm like, oh, yeah, I also have chronic migraines. Like, it's totally understandable to not want to look at a screen all day, and they think, oh, okay, so this person also understands my experience. Now I can be a bit more open with it or about it. I feel like over the years, as I've been more open about my disease, it's just been very um, rewarding and healing in that way because I'm feeling more validated in my experiences. And then I also know that others are as well. This is Dave Morris. And I had a question for me, Ling, actually two questions. Uh, my first question is, it appears that you, you've been interested in realism and super realism as, as your means of expression. So I was just curious when you decided to begin uh, addressing MS in your art, did it just feel natural to continue with, with the realism and super realism or were you attracted to being more abstract in, or a different way of expressing or portraying it visually? That was that's one question. The other question was, as I looked at your hand against the field of flowers, 
if I had not known the reason and background for painting it, I would have read other things into it. And so I just wondered also how important it is to you that people who view your work understand from where it comes as opposed to the work sort of having the freedom to attract different reactions and interpretations. A little bit about the hyperrealism question. I, I've been an artist my whole life. I've just been, I never thought I was going to go into art. I actually thought I was going to go into STEM until I was diagnosed. And I, at the time I was taking online classes and none of the um, intro to computer science classes were offered online. So I kept on like putting that off. And then I come from three generations of professors. So I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to major in art and be an art professor. I was always drawn to that sort of detail, that sort of very realistic sort of work. So it did it was kind of a more like natural shift when I started to work with more layering images and whatnot and having the, uh, especially in my symptom sketches, the mark often reflects the sort of symptom I'm experiencing. So I kind of, there are some works that are a bit more abstract in that sense, but I feel like the hyperrealism also, I don't know, it just, because I was talking about my own experience, that just felt the most authentic to myself. As far as the perception of the work goes, when viewers look at it, I I always include some information on the side in exhibitions if viewers are curious, but I've also found a lot of viewers are able to relate to the work, even if they don't know that it's specific to MS symptoms. I had a solo exhibition a couple of years back in my hometown, and there was a viewer who was talking about, oh, you know, like, this is, this is what it feels like for me, like when I'm having a bad mental health day. And they were mm -hmm. looking at um, my drawing that was like fatigue talking about fatigue and not being able to work on things because of the fatigue. And they're like, oh my gosh, like, this is how it feels like. It's like, it's right there and you want to do it, but there's a fog in the way and they don't have MS, but they were still able to connect with it in that way. And the same thing with the heat intolerance, you know, it's like, someone's like, oh my gosh, like, are you allergic to flowers? You know, and so the flowers are affecting you. You're trying to enjoy the flowers, but something's preventing you from doing that. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I am trying to enjoy the flowers and something's preventing me from doing that. But for you, it might be allergies. For me, it's my MS symptoms. I provide the information if people are curious, but I also, I don't mind if people are a bit more open in their interpretations. Mm -hmm. As long as they can find a connection with it, that's what I care about the most. So actually, I had a question for, for Delaney. As I listen to your presentation and as I understand your present situation, I, I wondered if what insights you might have about what the level of communication should be between the medical community and the patient. Because it certainly sounds like from early on, that was a frustrating part of your experience. So I just, I just was curious for your perspective on how you would see what the appropriate communication might be. And I realize it would depend on the age and circumstance of the patient. Yes, absolutely. I, I think that was one of my bigger frustrations growing up and everything. I really wanted to be involved in the discussions and it's tougher when you're you're a child. But even nowadays, like I would say, at least the field says that we, if you want to communicate your science to someone, it should be at an eighth grade vocabulary level or less. Quite frankly, I just feel like that's too high. I feel like you should be able to explain your work to a smaller child um, and have them understand, have mm -hmm. them ask questions. It's just so much more important to instead of use, you know, larger vocabulary and stuff like that, I, I just feel like it's way more important to have the other person understand, ask questions based off of their own experiences and everything like that. I feel like my frustrations were valid at the time, um, but even still, I mean, people, that's, this is the, the primary frustration just in the field in general. And from a scientific standpoint, I, I think we have that frustration as well. You know, I think there's a large gap between the, the, the public and researchers. I feel like what is what we're seen as is kind of like white lab coats behind closed doors. And, you know, we release these papers that are, you know, college level vocabulary. And I think that that's that's really the aspect that needs to take a shift here um, so that everybody is involved. And so I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. I, I love hearing that as somebody who's also patient. <laughs> Uh, I love hearing that. And also English is my second language to learn all the medical lingo is just like, I don't need this on top of like everything that I'm going through. Right. Uh, I think in some regards that applies to art too, right? Mailing, like there is an art lingo that 
makes art being uh, something very inaccessible for people. There's something obviously um, different fields, but relatable between the two. I wanted to like touch on a, um, another topic and yeah, if somebody has other questions, feel free to just, yeah, ask them. I'm really interested in, because both of your work deals with care, right? There's care in helping students uh, with disability, navigating school, right? Milling. There's also care in being vulnerable and like uh, showing work that is very personal. And there's care in doing a whole bunch of research so that other, others can have <clears throat> a better experience and better care in the future, right, Ilani? I wonder, how do you navigate the system uh, being yourself somebody who needs care? So do you have any tools, strategies for self-care within your field of work? Anything that helps you uh, also take care of yourself and not just others? I can go first on this. I, I think one of the biggest aspects um, for me in my work is to be fulfilled by what you do. I always say, if you love what you do, it does not feel like a job. And, you know, in, in this field in particular, it's it's really easy to lose sight um, as to why we do the things that we do. You know, um, it's it's easy when we work with mouse models or, or self culture or things like that, where we're not really interacting one on one with patients. I mean, even myself, I don't necessarily interact one-on-one -on -one with patients. Like I, I work with postmortem human tissue. And lucky for me, I, I don't get to forget this insight or, or why we do what we do. Um, you know, it's it's not like I, I pack up my stuff for the end of the day and I'm like, oh, that's it for, for MS research for me, right? I obviously come home, I I live with this condition and, and the complications with it. So the lines are, are a bit muddy, at least for me. I, I actually have a, I've made a perspective shift in the last, you know, decade and I'm actually honored to be experiencing this condition that millions of people are are suffering with and then get to apply it to the work that I do. I'm so fulfilled by it. I just absolutely love what I do. You can use your experiences to help other people. Like you said, Delaney is super rewarding, um, especially like even with disability accommodations, starting with a 504 plan, then accommodations in undergrad and grad school and just Kind of having to sit through all these meetings as a student and knowing what it's like to ask for accommodations and to be afraid to ask for accommodations and then working with students who are, you know, also have maybe having trouble asking for accommodations or students who are, you know, not sure of the differences between accommodations in high school versus higher education and talking about like, hey, I remember also being really frustrated about this, but we, we can go through this together and here are some of the ways that I coped with this and some of the ways that I dealt with this. And then seeing these students succeed and graduate, I'm just like, oh my gosh, it's just super great. But also there is that sense of like, I can also, I need to allow myself to take a step back sometimes. There was a while after getting my master's where I felt like all of the art I had to do had to be MS related because I was in that mindset for two years. And at one point I had to just be like, you know what, I should start doing art for fun again. That is one of the things that I kind of try to force myself to do is do art that isn't related to disability advocacy and try to have fun with it again. So I don't feel like obligated to tie it into this greater goal of mine to spread awareness and advocate for people with disabilities and invisible illnesses. Giving myself that sort of option to step back from it sometimes and also being very honest with myself. I do a lot of journaling. I've journaled since I was eight, um, just kind of writing somewhere where I know no one will ever look at it, but it's just for myself being in tune with like my own body and my own needs. And it helps me be realistic sometimes where I do find myself once again, maybe I'm having a bad fatigue day, but I'm pushing myself all right. I have to do all these things. Or if I don't make art for a while, am I still an artist? That sort of thing. And just kind of feeling like, well, you know, yes, I am still an artist, even if there are a couple months where I don't have the energy to create work, just talking to others about it also who have these experiences is super, it's a form of self-care, just finding community because it can be easier to be gentle with yourself, knowing that others are going through the same thing. And it's not just me being lazy or me disappointing everyone if I can't get this thing done and stuff like that. The sort of awareness, the self-awareness that comes with knowing your own condition in that way is like a form of self-care, just being self-aware. Thank you. I think that's uh, an incredible, incredibly relatable way of appreciating it. And that, yeah, giving yourself that sort of like kindness and like, it's okay. <laughs> I just want to like segue to this quick. Do you have any like ritual? I think maybe Miling, you like shared a little bit of like 
just making art that isn't about advocacy, right? I just wonder if you have any little ritual that kind of centers you back in your life and if you'd like to share that. Yeah, you're asking me, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, you're good. Yes. I would say so, for sure. I Absolutely. Um, outside of research, for sure. I'm a surfer. Um, I, I also journal and, and stay in tune with myself. And I love meditating and things like that. I really think, I mean, I, I take a good, at least 2024 20, goals. I take a good hour every morning trying to to keep my mind at, at ease and everything. There's a, a big contributor of stress and MS, um, especially, you know, from a, a pediatric standpoint. My rituals in the morning, I'll get up early and I'll just spend a whole time, a whole hour saying affirmations and, and visualizing and um, staying grounded. And I think that really actually kicks in journal. And I think that kicks my day into to a great gear. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think those are like the little tools that can help others, right? Like when you first get diagnosed, I mean, depending what age you are, uh, obviously, but those little grounding things that like somebody might suggest could be very helpful. So thank you. I just want to thank you both and just invite again uh, everybody here to dig deeper into mailings and Dilani's work. Yeah, thank you for being, yeah, for being so, yeah, for taking your time and, and sharing with us your work and for the work you're doing. Thanks thank for you. having me. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you again, Dilani and Mailing. Thank you so much, Zoe.